Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 161, we're going to talk about turntable and equipment ground returns. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult the professional technician when in doubt. Well, we've got a fun video planned for today, but before we get to that, our biggest sale of the year is well underway. Woohoo, well, Black Friday! <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it started with a bang and we just barely got the email blast out, so we're just keeping up. Um, and if you want the code, it's Black Friday 15, one word. But if you want more details, wait till the end and we'll go over the deals. So. Today we're going to talk about something maybe we should have talked about years ago, but honestly, I just presume grounding equipment, in particular, how to ground your turntable, was well understood. And we've been proven wrong recently. <laughs> yeah, well, that, I discovered that modern ragged tables do things very differently than just about everyone else. And of course, that got us into thinking about equipment grounding and talking with various friends and... Um, uh, that I well, mean, looking at different kinds of equipment and how they're doing their ground topologies. Yep. Yeah, uh, so I think Charles, it, it would be easier if we just shifted over to the music room where we can do some demonstrations and some props. Yeah. What you, yeah. Okay. Well, let let's head over there. Let's pop in there. Okay, we're in the music room, and here's our main table, and the. Probably, I think the thing that's the most confusing and difficult to understand is what the heck is the ground wire from the turntable. It typically will go to uh, your phono preamp. Ours, our kit preamp is right here, the universal, and it's got its ground strap. And that connects up, I can't show you easily, but that connects up into the back here, normally right where the RCAs are. And what is that connected up to? Why is it connected up to that? And what are the different configurations for it? Well, what you've got to remember is that m most tone arms are going to be of some sort of conductive metal. Not all, but most of them. Certainly there's going to be some metal down in here that's supporting your tone arm and the pivot and all of that. You may well have um, a motor mount that's all uh, steel. You might have a you might have a built-in motor. This project table is brilliant because it has an isolated motor. It's way over here on the other side, but the only thing that connects it to the table is the belt. That's it. Um, and I would call this sort of like the the best of the budget tables available. Um, but it's not really about the table. This is about grounding. So you've got all this metal here, and if you look at the tone arm in particular, it looks an awful lot like a poorly designed antenna. Well, that's exactly what it is. Anytime you've got anything, any length of metal, any chunk of metal, or even worse, um, a turntable motor, um, you're going to have electrical noise. Um, and the, the bigger the motor, the more the noise, um, the more noise that's in the room and in the area, um, the more something like the tone arm or the metal of the turntable is going to pick it up. So what do we do with that noise? Well, if we don't do anything with it, it's probably going to end up on the signal path. So let's just, right now we're connected up, let's just pull off the ground wire and just see if we can hear what that is. Let me turn it right up so you can hear it. Can you hear that? Okay, now let me just bring this in and we'll see. See that? Now, you can still hear some digital noise because we haven't isolated our... Um, uh, our wireless router. <laughs> our wireless router. But let me get that off. Um, and in fact, let me just turn this, turn these off. So that's what the, what that ground wire is doing. It's essentially a drain. 
Think of it as a an escape for all that electrical noise. So electricity follows the path of least resistance. So if the noise gets onto some metallic conductive part of the turntable and it immediately finds itself connected up to a ground tap and of course whether it's your phono preamp or whether it's a receiver that has um, a ground lug what it, or an integrated amp with a ground lug, it doesn't matter. That noise is all going to go straight to ground and it doesn't have much of a chance to get onto the signal wire. So that is, with turntables, that's a cri critical element. Now, so that, that's all it is. It's, it's just a straight copper wire. It can be solid core, it can be stranded. I like to use it a decent gauge, something like 22 gauge, and make a good connection at the end so that there's a very low resistance wire. But, you know, almost anything will work. Um, now, the reason why we ended up talking about this is because a really well-known turd table manufacturer has an entire modern line of tables in which they actually don't do it that way. They actually take that um, that ground return path or that ground drain wire and they stick it onto the shield of the left hand RCA. This is the shield right here. This is a very typical uh, RCA patch cord. It's a coaxial so this very center core usually a solid but it can be a stranded wire um, is your signal. It's on here. That this layer here, the white layer, this is isolating the signal from the shield. And of course the shield is not only is it returning, this is the negative path of the signal, not only is it returning that, but it's also picking up any noise and it's going to drain it as well to the ground return. So the reason why I think what Reg is doing is a really big mistake is that if you were to pick up a lot of noise, like I was just showing you, put it on here and put it fairly close to the actual signal wire, well, you might induce noise into your signal. And you might not always do this. In some cases, uh, your, your setup will be quiet. In other cases, it's going to be a big problem. So the solution to that is, is just simply to make up a ground wire and find some point on your turntable in which you have a metal part and if it's got a screw fastener on it then just back the screw off and make up a little ground wire and slip slip this underneath it tighten down your screw you might have to clean up the a little bit of paint so you get a, a good bare contact and bring that wire over to your uh, grounding post on your phono or your integrated amp and just do it as a test. You know, you, it's not a very difficult thing. And you may well find that your noise floor goes down or that you get rid of a big uh, hum problem. And that method of bringing another ground strap can be highly effective. So if you've got a noise issue between pieces of equipment, you may want to try strapping them. And the way you do that is, well, if you've got a ground post on one piece of equipment, you're in like Flynn, right? Well, you've got, a, you've got a post, you can get something onto it. You don't even have to make up a fancy wire. You can just strip a nice little wire and, and just get it onto the post. But what do you do if you don't have a post? Well, the back of virtually every amplifier ever made is going to have some screws. Just clean up a little spot. Be careful with what you're fooling around with. Make sure the amp's off while you're working, of course. But you can back a screw up clean off a bare piece of metal and slip under a piece of ground wire and and you're not you're not opening up the case all you're doing is working on the outside of the case so it should be relatively safe just use some common sense and just bring a ground across you may well find that a piece of equipment that's giving you trouble will now be quiet now why would that be the case well the single biggest problem with grounds is that they're never at exactly zero volts. Now, technically, that's how we design equipment, but there's no such thing as an exact zero volt ground. So what happens is you end up with differentials in ground. 
And then you can end up with, with ground loops, you can end up with noise that's related to that. The simplest tricks to avoid those kinds of problems is to have one high quality breaker bar in one outlet. All of your equipment gets plugged into that. That gives you the same uh, uh, ground voltage or relative ground voltage, hopefully. And if that hasn't solved any ground issues that you've got, then you can try strapping. Just like your turntable is strapped, you can try strapping various pieces of equipment carefully, especially if it's a big power amp, be very, very careful. In fact, if it's a big high powered power amp, that's something you should bring to a tech to play with. I wouldn't do that at home. I don't recommend it. But for little pieces of equipment like preamps that are having problems and DACs that are giving you issues, try that. I mean, it, it, it'll, it'll take next to no time. So hopefully, um, that will help people avoid some of the problems. 99% of all turntables that have ever been made in my experience, and I go back decades now, will provide a ground wire. All you have to do is get it on here and tighten it down onto a nice, onto a nice post like that and Bob's your uncle. There are some variations in how all this sort of plays out and there can be unique. Sometimes cartridges, most modern cartridges are plastic bodied. Some will have metal bodies, in which case they're going to, the designer or, or manufacturer are going to presume that the thing is going to, the metal body is going to connect up to the tone arm and of course it goes to that 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 ground wire that we've been talking about. But sometimes they actually will put a fifth connection onto the cartridge and they expect that that would be a mini little ground lug either to get you onto the tone arm probably you would just get that little ground that fifth wire up here and onto the bolt and bob's your uncle or you carry a fifth wire through the arm and pick it up that way so that would be a really unusual thing to come across and that would require some research but it's tough to do you know serious damage just connecting up a ground wire the way we've been talking about you may not be successful but in many cases maybe it'll fix the problem good luck everyone okay well that was fun and i hope you now have a better understanding of grounding your equipment and how to deal with problems when they crop up well for a long time we were under pressure to keep inventory of quality vintage power tubes, in particular the EL34s and the 6550s. We're still having problems with the KT88s, though we have some in stock. Um, and then Charles, um, the otherwise known as... The Tube Hound. Um, <laughs> ...found uh, some supplies, and we've been able to restock and keep up with customer demand. So, Charles, you've got some really high quality premium vintage power tubes available for the sale. I don't know how long they're going to last, but maybe you should show us what you've got. Yeah, well, so, you know, the last couple of episodes, we've talked about how we have tubes on the way in and many of them finally came in. And in those batches, we had large numbers of EL34s and 6550s. Well, you know, I say large numbers, but large comparatively. It's allowed us to build some more quads of new old stock and use tubes on almost all of these, except for the 6550Cs, you know, Finding, finding them new old stock is next to impossible. Yeah. We actually have uh, someone who wants to be a supplier who's in Russia, and he's been offering us thousands of them really cheap. <laughs> and we have a feeling that they're not quite legitimate tubes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we'd ever even get something from this guy. Yeah, who knows? And who knows what we'd get. Um, so what's come in is, uh, let's start over on this side here. Of course, we've got the 6550C original St. Petersburg Svetlana's. And you'll notice that we're a little more, more steady on the camera these days. And that's because I finally flipped the monitor upside down like we've been talking about. Well, let's hope everybody's <laughs> not viewing this upside down, too. Oh, I don't think they will. <laughs> anyway, so, of course, the original 6550C Svetlana has the rectangular plate holes, not the round ones. That's the easiest tell that gives them away. Watch out for the 
B version that was made by the original St. Petersburg plant and huh. they were a disaster. They, they were defective out of the box and you can tell those because they had round holes and they had side getters. So just ignore those entirely. They're not worth even trying out. The 6550C original St. Petersburg is the one that you're always looking for. Yeah, and we actually sold a quad just the other day. So we have some, mm -hmm. but they're not going to last long. Yeah, we and don't have a I lot think of them. we even have some spares, don't we? We have a few spares, which is actually kind of rare. And we always recommend buying a spare if you're getting high powered power tubes, EL34, 6550Cs. It doesn't matter what power tube you're buying, whether it's a 60 year old Mullard or um, a six day old Chinese tube. Actually, I would go with the Mullard over the Chinese <laughs> power tube. But you might but want to buy two sets of those if you're buying the Chinese ones. <laughs> maybe three or four. I mean, they're cheap. So, um, but you know, having them pop can easily destroy your amp at the same time if you're mm -hmm. not around to turn it off. But um, buying a spare, power tubes are not like preamp tubes, like a 6SN7 or 12AU7. Power tubes have a much shorter lifespan. They just work a lot harder. So you really, if you're running a quad, you should actually have five matched tubes on hand at any given time, or you're gonna go down for a little while. Yeah. Now the good news is we record the, the testing numbers of every single tube that goes out our door. So, so if you have a problem later on, there's a good chance we can find a match for you, but not always. So if you buy the spare now while we have it, mm -hmm. then you've, you've got it. Yep. So after the 6550Cs, we've got the Svetlana EL34s, and these are just beautiful power tubes. I mean, they're one of the more distinctive looking EL34s that you're ever going to find. And just like the 6550s and the KT88s that were made by Svetlana, there is a new production version of these tubes. It's not the same tube, it's made by New Sensor, and... There's a whole bunch of variations of it. Some yeah. of them look a lot like the original, and even we sometimes get fooled for a moment until we've had a good look at yeah, them. Yeah, they're very close. The easiest way to tell what these guys are these metal whiskers or spacers that are up here on the top mica. If it is a new production tube, all four are going to look like this bottom one here. They're not going to have these downward facing ones. So that is the easiest tell for them. But we have these new old stock and used. And for a while, it was really hard to find these tubes. But thankfully, the new sources that I've been pulling up have supplied us with, with a decent number of them. And of course, we have our beautiful Mullard XF2s, which is our favorite EL34 ever. And... You know, I'm, I'm still amazed that we can actually find some new old stock of these guys. Look at this beautiful old box. But they're expensive. Our wholesalers do not give them away. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. And they shouldn't because yeah. it takes a lot of work to find them out in the wild. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, we have, I mean, I don't know if it's half our inventory value, but we have a lot of money invested in stock because it you, you need about 20 to 24 tubes to be able to match a quad. So we keep a lot of inventory on hand. Now, the great thing about the Mullards, besides the fact that they, they're the best sounding EL34 ever made, in my opinion. The XF2 version. The XF2 version. Not the modern production version. <laughs> there are a lot of modern, and there's actually a lot of fakes out there as well that have nothing to do with uh, reproduction tubes. Mm -hmm. They're just relabeled garbage. Uh, often Chinese, but sometimes Eastern European tubes as well. Um, but we do have one used discount quad of the Mullards in stock. And um, after you use the Black Friday code, you'll get them for $7.99. It's not a garbage set. They're just testing on the lower end of what I would call acceptable, which in our business is what we call perfect. <laughs> yeah. So they're right on the edge. I could probably have sold them as new old stock and people would have loved them, but we That's don't... That's just not how we work. That's yeah. not how we work. We don't do it. Um, we try hard to supply great tubes every time. So anyways, there's just the one discount quad. Grab it and take your code 
and run. <laughs> You'll love them. You got one more that we really, those, all three of these EL34s are some of our favorite power tubes. Yep, that's why we stock them. I mean, we, we tend to only go after tubes that we like, that we like to listen to, that we like to work with, and the yep. RFT EL34 is, is no exception. And these are great because other than uh, the very first version of these tubes, the very last version of these tubes, and a couple from whenever they changed the factory they were being produced in, they were all built to the exact same um, set of parts, essentially. So they kept the same base height, the same plate structure, the same getters on them. Same sound. Which yeah, is same sound. The of the EL34s, the RFTs probably have the best detail. Yeah. The Mullers have the best warmth, best all around. They have the best warmth, the best detail. And the Svetlanas uh, have a little bit more warmth than the RFTs, but not quite as much detail. It's sort of in between them, yeah. You can't really go wrong with any of these tubes. And this is a neat example because most of the RFTs are rebranded. Yeah. Yep, and this one is actually an original RFT. Even though it doesn't have an RFT logo on here, what it does have is the stylized M that looks like a tube which marks this as being a Mühlhaus, Mühlhausen. I hope I'm pronouncing one of those right anyway. Sounds good. I'm not going to try. <laughs> so. Yeah. so it's marking it as being produced in that factory, which was the second factory that the RFTs were ever produced in. So this is a later production one, and it's the exact same as the earlier production ones before they, uh, they standardized on this normal base size here. And... They're just absolutely beautiful tubes. So we have each of these EL34s as new old stock and as used in quads. There are spares available. Um, they're great sounding. They're already cleared. Uh, they're ready to go. Yeah, well, thanks a lot for doing that, Charles. And if you stay to the very end, here's, here is the discount code to help you out. Uh -huh. Black Friday 15. Now, the... Sale is going to run uh, until uh, a week Monday, which is, do we have a date, Charles? That's going to be, oh, uh, is it the 20th? Uh, it'll be the 27th. It, oh, run, yeah. it runs, it runs, <laughs> yeah, it runs till the 27th. And on the 20, we'll talk a little bit more about this next week, but on the 27th, we're going to have our first promotion for kid apps. And the deal will be basically that for the universal pre and for the GU50 monoblock, you're going to get a set of premium vintage tubes as a gift, basically. That's the, that's the promotion. Um, we can never discount the, the kit amps. The margins are just way too tight. And, of course, costs on, on supplies are going up almost every day. So holding the price is getting harder and harder. Anyways, stay safe, everyone. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.